First, a short introduction to a letter from Santa Claus by Mark Twain. Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, was very enamored with his daughter Susie and remained so up to her untimely death at age 24 in 1896. In 1875, at the age of three, she had written her first letter to Santa Claus. As a writer and loving father, Twain couldn't stand for his young daughter to feel like her work went unheard. So he penned the following letter, My Dear Susie Clemens, from the man in the moon himself. This story has been widely shared since in anthologies as an endearing reminder of the spirit of Christmas and the love of parents for their children, who year after year, in various ways, manage to keep the magic alive. Now listen to a letter from Santa Claus by Mark Twain. My dear Susie Clemens, I have received and read all the letters which you and your little sister have written me. I can read your and your baby sister's jagged and fantastic marks without any trouble at all. But I had trouble with those letters which you dictated through your mother and the nurses, for I am a foreigner and cannot read English writing well. You will find that I made no mistakes about the things which you and the baby ordered in your own letters. I went down your chimney at midnight when you were asleep and delivered them all myself and kissed both of you too. But there were one or two small orders which I could not fill because we ran out of stock. There was a word or two in your mama's letter which I took to be a trunk full of doll's clothes. Is that it? I will call at your kitchen door about nine o'clock this morning to inquire. But I must not see anybody, and I must not speak to anybody but you. When the kitchen doorbell rings, George must be blindfolded and sent to the door. You must tell George he must walk on tiptoe and not speak. Otherwise, he will die someday. Then you must go up to the nursery and stand on a chair or the nurse's bed and put your ear to the speaking tube that leads down to the kitchen. And when I whistle through it, you must speak in the tube and say, Welcome, Santa Claus! Then... I will ask you whether it was a trunk you ordered or not. If you say it was, I shall ask you what color you want the trunk to be. And then you must tell me every single thing in detail which you want the trunk to contain. Then when I say goodbye and Merry Christmas to my little Susie Clemens, you must say, Goodbye, good old Santa. I thank you very much. Then you must go down to the library and make George close all the doors that open into the main hall, and everybody must keep still for a little while. I will go to the moon and get those things, and in a few minutes I will come down the chimney that belongs to the fireplace that is in the hall if it is a trunk you want, because I couldn't get such a thing as a trunk down the nursery chimney, you know. If I should leave any snow in the hall, you must tell George to sweep it into the fireplace, for I haven't time to do such things. George must not use a broom, but a rag, else he will die someday. If my boot should leave a stain on the marble... George must not wholly stone it away. Leave it there, always in memory of my visit. And whenever you look at it or show it to anybody, you must let it remind you to be a good little girl. Whenever you are naughty and someone points to that mark which your good old Santa Claus's boot made on the marble, what will you say, little sweetheart? 
Goodbye for a few minutes till I come down to the world and ring the kitchen doorbell. Your loving Santa Claus, whom people sometimes call the Man in the Moon. The Christmas Fireside Subtitled for Good Little Boys by Mark Twain Once there was a bad little boy whose name was Jim, though if you will notice, you will find that bad little boys are nearly always called James in your Sunday school books. It was strange, but still it was true that this one was called Jim. He didn't have any sick mother either, a sick mother who was pious and had the consumption, and would be glad to lie down in the grave and be at rest but for the strong love she bore her boy, and the anxiety she felt that the world might be harsh and cold towards him when she was gone. Most bad boys in the Sunday books are named James, and have sick mothers who teach them to say, now I lay me down, and so forth, and sing them to sleep with sweet, plaintive voices, and then kiss them good night, and kneel down by the bedside and weep. But it was different with this fellow. He was named Jim, and there wasn't anything the matter with his mother, no consumption, nor anything of that kind. She was rather stout than otherwise, and she was not pious. Moreover, she was not anxious on Jim's account. She said if he were to break his neck, it wouldn't be much loss. She always spanked Jim to sleep, and she never kissed him good night. On the contrary, she boxed his ears when she was ready to leave him. Once, this little bad boy stole the key of the pantry and slipped in there and helped himself to some jam and filled up the vessel with tar so that his mother would never know the difference. But all at once a terrible feeling didn't come over him, and something didn't seem to whisper to him, Is it right to disobey my mother? Isn't it sinful to do this? Where do bad little boys go who gobble up their good kind mother's jam? And then he didn't kneel down all alone and promise never to be wicked any more and rise up with a light, happy heart and go and tell his mother all about it and beg her forgiveness and be blessed by her with tears of pride and thankfulness in her eyes. No, that is the way with all other bad boys in the books. But it happened otherwise with this Jim, strangely enough. He ate that jam and said it was bully in his sinful, vulgar way. And he put in the tar and said that was bully also and laughed and observed. That old woman would get up and snort when she found it out. And when she did find it out, he denied knowing anything about it. And she whipped him severely and the crying he did himself. Everything about this boy was curious. Everything turned out differently with him from the way it does to the bad Jameses in the books. Once he climbed up in Farmer Acorn's apple tree to steal apples, and the limb didn't break, and he didn't fall and break his arm and get torn by the farmer's great dog and then languish on a sick bed for weeks and repent and become good. Oh, no, he stole as many apples as he wanted and came down all right. And he was all ready for the dog, too, and knocked him endways with a brick when he came to tear him. It was very strange. Nothing like it ever happened in those mild little books with marbled backs and with pictures in them of men with swallow-tailed coats and bell-crowned hats and pantaloons that are short in the legs and women with the waists of their dresses under their arms and no hoops on. Nothing like it in any of the Sunday school books. Once he stole the teacher's penknife, and when he was afraid it would be found out and he would get whipped, he slipped it into George Wilson's cap. Poor Widow Wilson's son, the moral boy, the good little boy of the village, who always obeyed his mother 
and never told an untruth, and was fond of his lessons and infatuated with Sunday school. And when the knife dropped from the cap and poor George hung his head and blushed, as if in conscious guilt, and the grieved teacher charged the theft upon him, and was just in the very act of bringing the switch down upon his trembling shoulders, a white-haired, improbable justice of the peace did not suddenly appear in their mists and strike an attitude and say, Spare this noble boy! There stands the cowering culprit! I was passing the school door at recess, and unseen myself, I saw the theft committed! And then Jim didn't get wailed, and the venerable justice didn't read the tearful school a homily, and take George by the hand and say, such a boy deserved to be exalted, and then tell him to come and make his home with him, and sweep out the office and make fires, and run errands, and chop wood, and study law, and help his wife do household labors, and have all the balance of the time to play, and get forty cents a month, and be happy. No, it would have happened that way in the books, but it didn't happen that way to Jim. No meddling of old clam of a justice dropped in to make trouble, and so the model boy George got thrashed, and Jim was glad of it. Because, you know, Jim hated moral boys. Jim said he was down on the milksops. Such was the coarse language of this bad, neglected boy. But... The strangest thing that ever happened to Jim was the time he went boating on Sunday and didn't get drowned. And that other time he got caught out in the storm when he was fishing on Sunday and didn't get struck by lightning. Why, you might look and look and look all through the Sunday school books from now till Christmas, and you would never come across anything like this. Oh no, you would find that all the bad boys who go boating on Sunday invariably get drowned, and all the bad boys who get caught out in storms when they are fishing on Sunday infallibly get struck by lightning. Boats with bad boys in them are always upset on Sunday, and it always storms when bad boys go fishing on the Sabbath. How this Jim ever escaped is a mystery to me. This Jim bore a charmed life. That must have been the way of it. Nothing could hurt him. He even gave the elephant in the menagerie a plug of tobacco, and the elephant didn't knock the top of his head off with his trunk. He browsed around the cupboard after essence of peppermint, and didn't make a mistake and drink aqua fortis. He stole his father's gun and went hunting on the Sabbath, and didn't shoot three or four of his fingers off. He struck his little sister on the temple with his fist when he was angry, and she didn't linger in pain throughout long summer days, and die with sweet words of forgiveness upon her lips that redoubled the anguish of his breaking heart. No, she got over it. He ran off and went to sea at last, and didn't come back and find himself sad and alone in the world, his loved ones sleeping in the quiet churchyard and the vine-embowered home of his boyhood tumbled down and gone to decay. Ah, no, he came home as drunk as a piper and got into the station house the first thing. And he grew up and married and raised a large family and brained them all with an axe one night and got wealthy by all manner of cheating and rascality. And now... He is the infernalist, wickedest scoundrel in his native village, and is universally respected, and belongs to the legislature. So, you see, there was never a bad James in the Sunday school books that had such a streak of luck as this sinful Jim with a charmed life.